Support for LAist comes from Apple TV Plus, presenting the limited series The Last Thing He Told Me, starring Jennifer Garner. TV Guide raves, we're living in the midst of a Jennifer Garner TV renaissance, an absolutely beautiful thing. The New York Times calls it a superior family drama, streaming on Apple TV Plus. At the end of this podcast, you can hear comments from The Last Thing He Told Me executive producer and star Jennifer Garner. Support for LAist comes from Pasadena Water and Power. Are you a Pasadena resident that relies on an electric medical device for life support? Help PWP better respond to power outages by notifying us at 626-744-4005 or go to pwpweb.com slash emergency prep. Studios. All right, let's see what this thing's all about. Right, a uh, 10 minute podcast episode script about LA culture called How to LA. All right, it's thinking. <laughs> oh my God. All right, check this out. Hello, and welcome to How to LA, the podcast where we dive deep into the vibrant and ever-evolving culture of Los Angeles. I'm your host, Brian De Los Santos, a native engineer. I'm Brian De Los Santos, and this is How to LA, but for real this time. We've heard everyone's hot takes in the past few months on AI, chat, GPT, and other developments in what's known as machine learning. A new artificial intelligence tool is going viral for cranking out entire essays in a matter of seconds. AI analysts say it's as revolutionary as the internet, but some say it's a threat to society. But one thing is for sure, it's sparking interest among everyone from top CEOs to students. The capabilities of all of this is what many people are talking about right now, from academia to journalism and, of course, creative works. It's been a key point in negotiations between the Writers Guild of America and the AMPTP, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, and one of the many reasons writers have been on strike since the start of May. I can tell you now definitively that AI does not have the trauma, the joy, or the lived experience to create any of these stories that we are honoring tonight. The Writers Guild is asking for constraints in the contract. Specifically, they want the studios and streaming services to agree that AI won't write or rewrite any literary material. And this is how the AMPTP has responded in a written statement. AI raises hard, important creative and legal questions for everyone. It's something that requires a lot more discussion, which we've committed to doing. AI is in every piece of technology that we use. But what's concerning is what AI will replace. Like, is some AI-generated voice going to take over this podcast soon? But before we go down the rabbit hole, we want to bring us all, and including myself, down to earth a little bit and start with the basics. What is artificial intelligence exactly? AI is just math. It's really glorious, complicated, beautiful math. It's not fancy Hollywood robots. This is Meredith Broussard. I am a professor at New York University. I teach data journalism there. I'm also the research director at the NYU Alliance for Public Interest Technology. The way that you make an AI system like ChatGPT or Dolly or Stable Diffusion or MidJourney is you take a whole bunch of data, you feed it into the computer and you say, computer, make a model. And the computer says, okay. And the model shows the mathematical patterns in the data. And then you can use that model to make predictions, to make decisions, to generate new batches of text to generate new images. And so that's why we have AI that we call generative AI, because it's generating new sentences or new images. The whole process overall is called machine learning, which is a really bad name because it suggests that there is a little brain inside the computer 
and there is not. So just to break it down a little, generative AI or AI-generated content is basically just using patterns from content that already exists. Generative AI is really good for mundane writing, and we all do a lot of that. ChatGPT is like a much more sophisticated version of the autocomplete that we're already accustomed to using in Gmail. You're writing an email in the Gmail app. It suggests the next word for you. And yeah, sometimes you accept that word and other times the word is kind of dopey. So you put in your own word instead. I really encourage everybody to try out some of the new generative AI tools. They are really easy to use. They're really nifty. At first, they are really fun. And for me, that fun lasts about 10 minutes. Because what happens is you very quickly realize that the text that something like ChatGPT is generating is deeply mundane. Like, it is cool that you can tell it, write me a pitch for a new series based on Pride and Prejudice, but set in outer space. And it will give you a thing that looks like a pitch. But, and there's a pretty big but here. If you are a business person in the studios, you may immediately think, oh my God, this is so great. This is free. I can replace a writer. And well, I'm a writer. I look at what ChatGPT generates and I think, oh my God, that is so boring. Which makes a lot of sense because how these systems work is they take all of this text that has been scraped from the internet or sourced from whatever book repository and they feed it all into the computer, say computer make a model, computer makes a model, the model generates text that's similar to what's seen before. So it's basically averaging together all of the text that is in the training data. That's why it works. And it's cool that it works, but it's just not that interesting. People working at the top of their game produce much better stuff than any artificial intelligence can. So maybe AI as a machine isn't really scary like The Terminator. You know, that old Hollywood movie starring our former California governor? But we'll get more into that after the break. Support for LAist comes from Rancho La Puerta, recently voted the number one international destination spa by Travel and Leisure magazine. Rancho La Puerta provides summer wellness retreats for individuals, friends, families, and groups who enjoy hiking, mindfulness, and fitness classes in a garden setting on 4,000 verdant acres of nature preserve. RanchoLaPuerta.com. This podcast is supported by Foothill Transit, who is greening big with the largest fleet of new hydrogen fuel cell buses in North America. You can be among the first to experience the power of hydrogen with its quieter and cleaner ride. More information about Foothill Transit's commitment to sustainability and their move toward a zero emissions bus fleet at foothilltransit.org slash greening big. You're listening to How to L.A., I'm Brian De Los Santos. Film and TV writers are still on the picket line this week fighting for new job protections, including how artificial intelligence will be used and not used in the creative process. So let's dig a little deeper into how it is and isn't impacting creative jobs. Can you just like put it in plain English how the data turns into an essay for maybe one of those college students that's looking for help? Sure. Even a, a script for maybe a show. The basics of AI are you have a whole bunch of data. This is Mike Anony. I'm an associate professor of communication and journalism at the Annenberg School at USC. What happens is you have a whole bunch of people who are often poorly paid and making their own interpretations, and they do what's called training that data. And what that means is just taking you know every essay they see, every job candidate they see, every credit risk they see, and they just make a score. They make a judgment. They say, yes, that's a good job candidate or a bad job candidate. And they do that over millions and millions of data. And what that means is you eventually get what's called a model. 
That's what AI has been for a very, very long time. It's just been finding patterns in that data. What has happened in the last, you know, really the last year, well, six months even, is that what they're saying is instead they're asking questions of that model to say, make me a good essay or invent for me a resume of a good job candidate. These are wholly, you know, they're made up. They're make believe. Mm -hmm. They don't exist, right? The, the essay doesn't exist. The image doesn't exist. But what it does is this generative AI makes media. It makes an essay. It makes a picture. It makes a video based on what it thinks is a quote unquote good example or a standard example or an expected example. It's not smart. It's not intelligent. It's not, you know, conscious in any way. All it's doing is it's reflecting back the patterns that exist in that data. So if you say, you know, write me a good essay about, you know, Hamlet, then it'll mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm going to go and read every possible essay I can find on Hamlet. And it turns out that a lot of those essays have characteristics to them. They share common features. They start with an intro that sounds a certain way. They have three parts to their argument, and then they have a conclusion. And if you show that model enough essays, the model learns and it says, oh, okay, I got a pretty good idea of what makes a good essay. But it's, it's not creative. It's not going to probably surprise you in a way. So that's what's starting to happen in this quote unquote generative AI turn, which is sometimes also called synthetic media really, really good writing, it should break categories. It should surprise you. It shouldn't just mimic or replicate all the patterns that exist in the world. It should take risks. It should do things that are unexpected. And those kinds of things are always a product of human creativity. There's lots of things that you and I have both seen that we've never written down, but they're in our brains somewhere. They're in our hearts, our souls somewhere. Ideas of joy or, or hope or fear that might motivate us, that might be part of who we are as creators. It's that little dance, you know, that makes makes good art art. Honestly, I'm not worried that generative AI is going to replace writers. I think that sort of disrespects, you know, who writers are and what writers can do. What I would worry about though is that if the studios or sort of the you know, the business side of cultural production decides that, eh, this script is good enough, or mm. this is a good enough story that exists in the world, that's where I think there's a real danger. I mean, we've seen this go down already. Sure, there's so good TV and film out there, but there's also a lot of pretty disappointing flat shows flooding our streaming services. The idea that AI could potentially write the scripts for this sort of content Making it even more common and cheaper to produce is a little bit demoralizing. And it also got us thinking about what stories will be told and about who. I'm not quite sure if AI is going to be able to pick up on like a story that I see myself reflected as a queer, undocumented Latino man in, in LA, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or the, the, my friend circle or, or the coworkers around me. So I think it's really important to know what you just said is writers bring this perspective that AI may not have. And AI might just write something super bland that is not challenging mm -hmm. anything culturally. That's spot on because the AIs only reflect the data that they're given. And when you think about the dominant movies and characters and TV shows, the, what has dominated a lot of American cultural spaces of what's on TV, what's the movies, it, it's been white, it's been male, it's been, you know, on the coasts, it's been a very, very sort of, I'd argue, narrow view of what the world is. So suppose you just feed all of that data into a generative AI system and say, well, now make me a new story. Yeah, you're going to see exactly those patterns again. And again, it's not because the AI is like making a moral decision. The AI is dumb as rocks. It only knows what the data is that it's fed. So in a way, this is such an important moment to make sure that we don't get this wrong. There's a huge concern about job stability. Should writers be concerned at all about AI replacing a certain aspect of their jobs or their jobs entirely? What I could see happening is that 
all of the sort of risky, messy, honestly inefficient parts of writing where it's a lot of brainstorming, it's a lot of trying to figure things out at the early stages of what a story looks like. If a studio decides, you know, that's really expensive, that's really risky, it takes a long time, we don't get a lot out of it always, we're going to instead give writers starting points. We're going to give them frames. We're going to give them, you know, arcs and sketches to work within. You know, is that replacing the writer? No, it, but it's giving them a really different starting point. That's the nuance that I would be concerned about is to say, do writers have the power to push back and say, no, don't give me an AI generated starting point? That's where the good stuff happens. It happens in that messy, high risk, sort of inefficient space of cultural production. How do you feel like it might be used overall, just in general, AI might be used in the near and far future? If there's anything that would keep me up at night, it's that. It's like, what counts as good enough? What counts as, meh, we'll ship it. It'll be enough to sell advertising against. It'll be enough to do something that's okay. That, I think, could be a near-term outcome where studios look at that situation and say, it's relatively cheap to produce content that's good enough. Honestly, without AI, we already have a ton of examples of that kind of content that's streaming or on cable TV for sure. Is that there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not great quality, but it's formulaic. You know how to turn it out. That's what I potentially see is sort of those types of mediocre content just becoming more prevalent, more normal, more more accepted. What would you say to folks who are nervous or maybe even panicking about AI, creating taking over creative spaces and content. Take a step back and know who you are. Know your voice, know what you want, what kind of creator you want to be, know what you value. What's your line that you won't cross? What do you wish the world looked like that you want to achieve through your stories? To me, that's way more important than you know any technical question because the technology is going to change. It's already gotten better from GPT three to GPT four, it's just going to get better and better as we go. This is maybe a little controversial. It's like maybe some synthetically generated media, maybe it works for people. Mm. That's okay. If it works for them and they're like, yeah, no, this is, this is the story I want that I want to be in the world. Okay. Um, you know, that's, that's a perspective to have, but I think we got to get better at saying, well, but could we have a better story? Why do we want that story? It almost matters less whether an AI wrote it or a human wrote it. We more have to look at the power that these stories have to reflect the world or change the world. What I think it can do is it can help us have conversations about what we care about. Is that technology getting you closer to or further away from the kind of world that you want to exist? Alrighty, y'all. That's all we've got for you today. That was Meredith Broussard and Mike Anani. Thanks for sticking with us on this AI Explainer. We'll continue to explore this subject in the coming weeks. This episode was produced by Megan Botel. Our other producers are Evan Jacoby and Victoria Alejandro. You may have heard the news already. Gloria Molina, a prominent Chicana leader in Los Angeles, died on Sunday after a battle with cancer. She left a historic legacy. She was the first Latina on the LA City Council and the LA County Board of Supervisors and founded La Plaza de Cultura y Artes in downtown. Later this week, we'll be highlighting her work that has colored LA culture for decades. See you mañana. Hasta luego. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. Support for LAist comes from Apple TV Plus, presenting the limited series, The Last Thing He Told Me, starring Jennifer Garner and based on the number one New York Times bestseller. Here's The Last Thing He Told Me, executive producer and star, Jennifer Garner. The last thing he told me, as you read it, or as I read it, you could see it play out in front of you. The tension between the mystery and between the character, the relationships, is really unique. You feel like, oh, this is a mystery. Oh, this is a thriller. Oh, this is this. But really, it's a story about parenting and about motherhood and about love. And that is a, that's a thrilling and very rare combination. Jennifer plays lead character Hannah Hall. 
I love Hannah's strength, and I love that she's discovering it as she goes along. I love that Hannah's a grown-up. She can be taciturn. She's not warm and fuzzy. She's not, um, she's not someone who has honed her maternal instinct. I don't think she's someone that would, you know, say, let the children come unto me. She's definitely like, oh, your kids are cute. Please keep them on the other side of the room. And that's different for me, definitely. And Gowrie Rice plays Bailey, Hannah's stepdaughter. Bailey is a teenager. She's 16. She's in the throes of high school and of self-expression and purple and pink hair. And Gowrie is the absolute only perfect choice for Bailey Michaels. I can't imagine anyone else in the role. I don't know, how do you even talk about a 21-year-old that you totally fallen in love with. I mean, she's such a peanut. She's brilliant as an artist. She's brilliant as a friend and a person. And she's just an incredible thinker. There are very few people who are 50 my age who I feel this way about. Here, Jennifer comments about the outstanding production team behind The Last Thing He Told Me. I've never been on a show that had more women in charge. I've never been on a show that had more conversations about wardrobe, hair and makeup, all for the betterment of all of us. I've never been on a show that's been run better or that took parenting into um, account or it, it really is, there's something about when you just let the people who rule the world actually run the show, Chef's kiss. TV Guide raves, we're living in the midst of a Jennifer Garner TV renaissance, an absolutely beautiful thing. The last thing he told me, now streaming on Apple TV+. How to LA is supported by Peerspace, the website for hourly venue rentals for meetings, productions, and events. Find a space and make your event a reality with Peerspace. Enjoy 10% off your next booking at join.peerspace.com slash howtola.